Welcome to the Exchange Server 2016 course on mailbox databases. In this module, we're going to talk about site resiliency. So this is one step further than high availability. This is where you want to stretch your database availability group to another site, maybe on the other side of the coast, or maybe in another town, or maybe even on the other side of the world, so that you can survive a lot more failures. Uh, so site resiliency has also got a lot of history in exchange. This previously was uh, an event like a disaster when uh, everything else failed. All the things that you did in exchange to keep exchange up and running. You built in redundancy, you had extra storage, you had multiple servers, you had uh, multiple power uh, inputs and so on. If all of those things failed and you have to finally move your whole setup to a, another side that was a manual operation so now you declare a disaster and you say okay uh, something really bad has happened everything that i planned uh, that i hope never would go wrong went wrong and now I'm going to fail over. I'm but, going to 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 activate right. my and that's that's progress. Uh, you know, the, the it was disaster recovery is the catchphrase that yes. you're talking referring to, and that was being more reactive. Whereas now, these days with exchange data, uh, the exchange data native data protection that's built into the DAGs and the features in Exchange 2016, yeah. uh, you can be proactive. Yes. And the catchphrase now is site resiliency. Yes. So. It's really now uh, about even surviving the ultimate thing that was your worst nightmare, that your data center is down, uh, you fail over to East Coast or West Coast, depending on where you are, and life carries on. And, and, and nobody cries because the email is down. I've been at a lot of organizations where when email goes down, then people are crying. They are crying and they just pack up and go home. It's because I cannot work. Yes. You know, I don't know what my next appointment is. I cannot send a mail to my colleague to initiate a deal or something like that or work on my project. Um, email has become business critical in sure. a lot of organizations. And if email is down, they literally cry. And so um, these are all mechanisms to make sure that exchange will never go down. So uh, when we uh, want to implement site resiliency, we talk about uh, making exchange available on another data center so that you can fail over to that other data center and continue running exchange. So it's, it's not about uh, one data center. So that's why it's called site resiliency. You, uh, you resilient of a failure of a single site. And so you have another site that's got everything in there and you can carry on working. So when we uh, think about, and I say something silly like everything is there, there's actually a lot of things that you have to think about to make sure that everything is there. And so the first thing that you have to think about is your requirements. Uh, what is your requirements for site resiliency? If you're running one of those uh, businesses that uh, relies on email and if email goes down, then uh, you have to say, what is my, uh, what they call RTO, recovery time objective. Is that the same thing as SLA or service yeah. level agreement? So this yeah. is part of your service level agreement. You decide, okay, I have a service level agreement with my users. Um, I'm the IT provider in this organization. And in the service level agreement, I'm going to say, uh, define two things, uh, RPO, a recovery point objective, and a RTO, a recovery time objective. And a RPO is the definition of how much data am I prepared to loss in terms of a, a, a disaster, a RPO. So if I say I'm willing to lose about uh, a, a days of information, that's not a catastrophe, I can recreate that data and carry on, then uh, your requirements might be something like, oh, I can do a daily backup and restore that backup. But if you have, uh, say, I cannot lose any of those things, then your requirements is typically something else. Like, I'm not willing to lose one email, so I need to have a, a solution that protects me from not ever losing one email. And so your recovery point objective then becomes less. 
you have to also accept that uh, you cannot cater for all scenarios, you know, in a, a, a major disaster, an earthquake or something, somebody is going to say, well, you know, email is not important. Uh, there's a lot more things more important that you need to take care of. So you have to be realistic with your requirements as well. Uh, once you've um, defined all your requirements, then you could build out the solution that meets those requirements. So it's, 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 it's something that you have to do. You have to really think about what is required to survive this type of outage and, and, so, and, and how do you want to recover quickly. How, how many database availability groups or how many database members uh, in each database ability group that you place in each uh, data center. Yep. Um, are you going to have one active site and one passive site? Uh, one active site, one passive site, and then a site with the fit file witness server? Or are you going to have two active sites? Yes. So this is all questions that you uh, need to uh, ask yourself because if you have active, passive, then um, maybe you're lucky and there will never be an outage and so those servers will be just idling receiving replication traffic in the passive side and they will never really be used um, so some people don't like that idea that you have servers that is just there in case something highly unlikely happens you know sometimes that doesn't happen <laughs> hopefully most of the time it doesn't happen um, but if you have an active active site then you use that hardware on the other side as well, but then there's consequences to that because if you have a failure, then would one site be able to run all the users? So now you have sort of double the load on the servers. So, you know, there's a trade-off that you have to think about if you have active, active versus active passive. Uh, you also have to think about site resiliency for client connectivity. Maybe you've replicated your databases to another site but the clients cannot connect to the other side. So uh, you've achieved your server's high availability, but no client can connect. You know, it's like that old uh, a joke where somebody phones the power utility and say, uh, my power is down, uh, can you do something about it? And they say, but you know, there's nothing wrong here, yeah, our lights is on. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to think about the experience from the client side, can they connect? Is there network connectivity? Is the, the bandwidth there to sustain the connections from uh, the clients? And, and so that is important as well. Uh, all the components inside of your network, like the DNS, uh, on the other side, DNS needs to run on that, uh, your site resilient site as well, so the name resolution continues to work on that side. So if speaking of DNS, and going back to the site resiliency with uh, client connectivity, I imagine, using load balancers in each of the sites is yeah. very important. Yes, so you have to have those load balancers so that uh, it load balances the traffic across all the servers in each site. And when you fail over to the other site, you still have that functionality. You don't run in some degraded service uh, that um, only offers one server to the users. Uh, your mailbox databases, uh, how do you replicate them? Whether you're gonna have lag copies on the other site, that's important as well. So. Uh, if uh, you have four copies on one, uh, one side and you only have one copy on the other side, maybe you, you, you figured that, okay, in a disaster, it's okay to have just one copy. But imagine if you have a disaster and now you failed over to the other side and it's barely running. It's now it's giving users access to their mailboxes. Uh, people are in crisis mode trying to recover the primary data center and uh, you've got all your attention focused on, on rebuilding the primary data center. I don't know what disaster happened, but now, you know, everybody is panicking and so on. And the other side is running on one database. Maybe that's good enough for some companies. But if something happens to that one database, then everything is down. You, just that last threat is broken. And so uh, maybe you need to have availability on the other side as well so that you can sustain more issues and you can work on the other side and bringing up the primary data center without worrying that uh, something will happen to the s secondary data center. So uh, that's something uh, that's important to set up with your database availability groups and the number of copies and so on that you have in your databases. 
Um, so uh, in terms of setting this up and when we want to implement database availability groups and site resilience, uh, we mentioned you have to uh, set up client connectivity to the other side. Uh, so you need to be able to tell uh, or have a way for, say, uh, your primary data center is on the West Coast and your secondary data center is on the East Coast. If you have users in the West Coast, how will they connect to the data center in the East Coast yeah, when the uh, West uh, Coast is down? Yeah, obviously you're going to need multiple MX records. Multiple MX records, uh, maybe uh, multiple uh, ISPs or, or people that provide your network, MPLS networks that can survive that because if a hub site is down, there should be another link that gets you to the East Coast to get that information. So uh, client connectivity, is, is, is you have to think from the client, that PC, all the way to the data center is that um, uh, component there. If you have to, if you want to configure data resilience, uh, you have for the databases. You also have to think about how do you fail over. Is it going to be a manual operation? Um, some organizations want that functionality, so you're going to set up your database availability group to not automatically fail over to the other side. You want to say, oh, um, something happened. I'm going to initiate this process of failing over to the other side, where I have to do configuration updates and DNS and so on. Or uh, you want to set it up in a way so that it can fail over automatically to the other side. And so one of the options when you um, set up a, 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 a mechanism where it fails over to the other side is you need to think about your quorum because if you have three servers in your primary site and three servers in your secondary site and the network link between the two is down, then how are you going to achieve quorum if you want to fail over to the secondary site? And that's where we recommend that you have a third site where you have your file share witness. And so the site that is up and can connect to the third site to run uh, your um, database availability group file share witness, then that site will be up and running and be able to serve users. But, but, but is it practical um, to expect that companies can afford to run not two, but now three sites I need to run? Yeah, so um, some organizations only have one site or two sites. That's all they have. And, and, and the, the choice between, oh, I'm going to run this um, third site on uh, maybe <laughs> on a PC underneath somebody's desk and in the evening, that's some not an attractive option. <laughs> that's not an attractive option because that's a critical server that achieves um, quorum. So um, there's other options as well. So um, it's now supported to have this witness server in Azure. So you can have a file share witness server hosted in Azure. So Microsoft could be Microsoft Data Center can be your third site where you can host your uh, file share witness server. You need to have a the domain controller as well because it needs the authentication mechanisms and you need to have the necessary network infrastructure um, to that uh, the database. Um, I assume both of these servers, the DNS server and the Azure uh, file witness share are running on virtual machines in yes. Azure. Yeah. So it would be virtual machines in Azure, but you have the, um, the right connectivity, express route connectivity, VPN connectivity to that site so that the um, uh, secondary site will be able to mount or will be able to lock that file share witness in Azure. Um, so um, then it's sort of uh, you don't need infrastructure and a data center because Microsoft hosts that uh, file share witness for you as a virtual machine. Mm. Yeah. Um, in terms of the failover process, you also need to think about how you're going to accommodate uh, this failover. As I mentioned before, uh, some organizations want to say databases can fail over automatically inside a site. Um, and this is where you set up your database availability group to say um, failover can happen inside this, uh, this site only or in the DAG. Or you want to say, no, you need to do manual intervention. So I'm going to fail it over and um, jump in. And this is where you enable DAC mode, uh, database um, activation and coordination so that um, you prevent the databases to split and also um, create servers on the other uh, mount databases automatically so that you manually intervene into that process. So um, 
site resiliency is a really important um, topic and you have to define your requirements, you have to plan this well and at the end of the day it's a good thing to test this as uh, you know the, if you just implement all of these features and you run like this for three years or two years and then all of a sudden you have a disaster and you don't know what's going to happen and you haven't tested this and you don't have that survival kit uh, then uh, you know who knows what's going to happen in that environment. So uh, that's our module on site resiliency. And uh, we guys, uh, we, we um, want to also invite you back to uh, watch our video on backups. Um, some organizations still need to do backups, but we're gonna tell you about some of the features in Exchange called Exchange Native uh, Protection that uh, may potentially help you to never do backups again. So stay tuned for that.